When I first moved to Amsterdam, I was told in order to cycle like an Amsterdamer, I would need to pass several tests. Number one, cycle home drunk. Number two, send a text message while cycling home drunk. And if I was feeling truly ambitious, number three, cycle home drunk at night without working lights in a rainstorm on the wrong side of the street with a passenger sitting on the back. Of course, cycling in these conditions increases your chances of injury, and most of what I listed is technically illegal, but few police actually enforce traffic laws for cyclists. Disobedience of traffic systems seems incredibly commonplace. As a result, public opinion on this topic is divided, some appreciating the current relaxed legal structure, while others feeling the rules of the road should be enforced to the same degree for each road user, be it cyclist, motorist, or scooter driver. There was a popular study performed by the University of Groningen that received a lot of attention in the media. 7,510 cyclists were given breathalyzer tests between 1 and 3 a.m. in the streets of Groningen and Den Haag. Of those tested, 89% had been drinking, and 68% were above the legal limit. There are no statistics for Amsterdam, but traffic experts estimate the numbers would be similar here in the country's capital. Newspapers latched onto this story, and it really fanned the flames of debate. But besides biking home after a couple of beers, it's also common for cyclists to travel by night without working lights, cycle on sidewalks, fail to stop at pedestrian crosswalks, and blast through red lights at intersections. The list of common infractions is quite long. There are fines to discourage this rolling rebelliousness, yet the threat of penalty does little to curb this behavior. To a visitor in the city, it's easy to think that Amsterdam is a lawless wild west of cycling. But maybe there's a method to all this madness. The term used in active transportation circles for cyclist disobedience is non-conformist behavior. This behavior was first studied in Amsterdam by the Urban Cycling Institute at nine different points in the city. A system developed by the team at Copenhagen Eyes, called the Desire Line Analysis Tool, recorded the movement of more than 18,000 cyclists during the morning rush hour. Of these cyclists, the vast majority obeyed the rules of the road, and most non-conformity had no effect on other road users. In fact, less than 5% of all cyclists impeded vehicle movement. These studies were also important because they highlight how swarms of bicycles during peak hours exceed the physical space designated for cyclists. During rush hours, cyclists are bottlenecked by roads, curbs, sidewalks, traffic lights, and other physical barriers. They need to navigate a complicated maze of obstacles and traffic in order to cross busy intersections. Taking shortcuts, using sidewalks, or zipping across on red lights is often the most rational decision a cyclist can make during these peak times. Disobedience of traffic rules is inevitable, and in some ways justifiable, if the laws and built environment were not designed to match the needs of cyclists. In another way, cyclist disobedience illustrates the high status that bicycles have on Dutch roadways. Just consider accidents involving vehicles and cyclists. In the vast majority of cases, the motorist is liable, full stop. While it is theoretically possible for a motorist to argue that the cyclist was at fault, this is a really difficult case to make. Even if an accident occurs when a cyclist runs a red light, the motorist cannot argue that the cyclist's behavior was unexpected and unavoidable. After all, non-conformity among cyclists is normal in the Netherlands, and a driver has to be prepared for the erratic behavior of cyclists at all times. Judgment between these two modes of transport differ because vehicles can and do take lives during accidents, while bicycles rarely, if ever, do. Dutch traffic laws for cyclists exist in the grey area similar to the country's drug policies. Despite the international fame that the Netherlands has for coffee shops and marijuana paraphernalia, most would be surprised to know that cannabis is still a controlled substance. The Dutch law enforcement policy is actually one of non-enforcement, and it works because it encourages police to focus on bigger criminal issues rather than making small busts for soft drugs. And the tax revenue for marijuana sales offsets the potential public health risks associated with soft drug use. There are many international cities where strict laws are enforced on cyclists. Laws such as mandatory helmet laws. While these policies are rooted in concern for public safety, they also discourage many from taking their bikes to school, to work, or out for a night. And ultimately, a system of punishment decreases the likelihood of fostering a strong cycling culture thereby missing out on the many social and economic benefits. While countless cities are discussing ways to promote cycling in society, 
All too often, the discussion hinges solely on bicycle infrastructure. But a cycling culture is created from more than bike lanes. It is a complicated balance between infrastructure, policy, and law enforcement, or lack thereof. The question I keep asking myself is whether or not cycling disobedience can be indicative of a successful active transportation system. If cyclists feel safe enough to ride through red lights without concern for injury and fine, maybe the system is working perfectly. I don't have an answer to this, but I do have a bicycle without working lights and some friends to meet for some beers. Problem? In Amsterdam, I think not.